Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. It was near the end of June 1674 when the unassuming merchant man Content arrived in the harbor at Port Royal, Jamaica. She wasn't an impressive ship. She carried no guns beyond small firearms and didn't have the sleek build of a ship meant for speed. The Content was broad and bluff. She was built to carry cargo and to arrive at her destination safely. On that day in June, she began unloading her cargo. There were foodstuffs from England, there were articles of clothing and fabric in the fashion of the French. These ships that made journeys across the Atlantic Ocean made their living trading goods, but the content had a different cargo that was somewhat more important. She was carrying people. Not slaves, as so many ships were, the content was carrying passengers. Now, of course, passenger ships weren't at all uncommon. Jamaica, at the time, the late 17th century, was something of a prison colony. All English colonies were prison colonies on some level at that time, but Jamaica more than most. It was a place where cut purses and confidence artists and highwaymen, murderers, mutineers, a place where they all arrived regularly. Was there a little uprising in Ireland or Scotland, or maybe some religious radicals decided to have a protest and it got out of hand? Well, you execute the ringleaders, and you ship the rest off to Jamaica and get them out of our hair, our powdered, impeccably curled hair. But even more common than the criminals were the debtors. These were men and women who just had an outstanding debt that they were unable to pay, and so they were sold into indentured servitude and shipped off to the colonies. Now, the men worked in deadly, dangerous sugar processing, and the women typically were sold off to brothels. But debtors, criminals, and even the slaves were unable to fill the labor deficit that was caused by the explosion of sugar production in Jamaica. Now, back in England, there were gangs of roving thugs who would skulk about taverns and brothels, looking for men that they could get drunk enough to sign a piece of paper, or, if that was out of the question, just knock over the head and hustle aboard a ship. Either method was fine. It didn't matter to them, since the man in question was pretty much out of options when he woke up with a pounding head to find himself already at sea and sold into servitude. But the passengers disembarking from the content were a different breed. They weren't nobles or officials, but passengers of just high enough standing that they managed to slip through the cracks. Some of them just barely. The first of these passengers to step onto the docks was the doctor and his his wife. They were dressed in an approximation of English finery. They were dressed well enough. He was a stiff-necked, proper sort, and she wasn't. His wife had a mischievous air about her, and the look of a very common birth, with probably something of a scandalous past. There was also a surgeon on board, who was either headed for a plantation, or more likely worked somewhere on a ship, You see, the tropical climate there in Jamaica was difficult for most Europeans to acclimate to. More than a few died of flux or yellow fever or malaria within just a few weeks of their arrival, so doctors were in high demand. Also on board, there was a carpenter and a mason. Jamaica was, well, it was a a booming economy, and their trades would be put to good use. But then there was another man. He was wearing the clothes of a young gentleman, if a bit travel-worn and rumpled. His shoes were fine, buckled, but in need of a brush, and then he had a chest containing all of his worldly possessions. His hair was naturally curly, shoulder-length, and kind of a rusty dark brown. He had a prominent nose and a pinched mouth that had a well-bred quality to them, and his eyes were dark and deep. They were curious and penetrating, not wise, but somehow dangerous, the sort of eyes that remind you of a shark's eyes. It was June 1674, and the young William Dampier had arrived in Port Royal. This is Episode 36, Gentlemen and Scoundrels, Part 1. William Dampier heaved a sigh of relief upon his arrival in Port Royal. His journey had been a dangerous one, but it wasn't pirates or the Spanish or tropical storms that worried him. These were threats that anyone at sea would be wise to steer clear of, but William was an accomplished seaman and knew these threats well. 
No, what worried him on the voyage to Jamaica was the threat of being indentured. The captain stood to make a good amount of money if he cajoled the young man into servitude, and he tried his hardest even before the voyage began. See, Dampier was traveling to Jamaica to take a position as a plantation manager for his father's former landlord. The elder Dampier had been dead ten years by now, but the landlord, a man named Colonel William Hellier, knew just how bright William was. Now, his father had died when he was ten years old, and William had been sent off to study. He'd learned Latin, arithmetic, French, and a good bit about the natural sciences. Now, Colonel Helliar noticed the young man's potential, and he arranged a voyage to France and to Newfoundland. But the boy had a proclivity for crops and animals. By the age of sixteen, he knew all there was to know about the crops on Helliar's estates, and, frankly, every other estate he'd ever visited. He studied them vociferously. It was some years later, at the age of twenty-three, that the colonel sent Dampier to Jamaica to serve as a manager on his sugar plantation. But from the beginning, it wasn't what Dampier had expected. Dampier had agreed to take the position to fund his travels. He loved to see new things, and he took a particular interest in documenting everything he came across— the flora and the fauna around him, the local customs, the, even the weather patterns. Hellier agreed to supply Dampier with what he needed as a payment for a term on his plantation. However, before setting out, when Dampier went to collect the promised supplies from the colonel's agents, they balked at the request. He required quills, ink, and paper, and lots of them. He needed shoes, clothes, soap, sugar, nutmeg, and a greater for the nutmeg. The agents complained of the extravagance of the request and insisted that the only way they could supply his needs was if Dampier agreed to be indentured. Now, they only informed him of this once he was on board the content. Naturally, William refused, loudly and forcefully. He cried foul. He called the men kidnappers. The others on board, especially the mason and the carpenter, supported him. It was clear that those two feared for their own freedom once the ship set sail, and... Things on board quickly grew pretty tense. The ship was on the cusp of real violence if anyone dared breathe a wrong word. But then the bubble popped through another revelation. The doctor who was on board had arrived with the boy who was intended to accompany him. The captain, though, was suspicious of the boy, so he took the two into the cabin. After a thorough and deeply personal examination, it was revealed that the doctor's boy was, in fact, a woman. The doctor claimed it was actually his wife, but the truth was pretty obvious. The upstanding, well-to-do doctor was running off with a mistress of questionable honor. At best, she was an adulteress. Now, the potential for scandal pushed aside the question of Dampier's standing on the voyage for a time. The crew found the woman a proper dress and bonnet, and insisted that she travel as a lady, everyone very politely referring to her as the doctor's wife. In the end, it hardly mattered. He was to work on that same plantation as Dampier, and if he chose to take a back-alley strumpet with him, well, Jamaica was a forgiving place for all kinds of behavior. Once the voyage was underway, though, the question of indenture came up again. Dampier's status wasn't totally clear, and the captain was pressuring him into signing his freedom away. There was a sort of unspoken threat of, you know, being thrown over the side of the ship if he didn't. Dampier was outraged. His passage had been paid, and he was set to manage the plantation of a powerful Englishman, and he refused to be treated this way. The mason, the carpenter, and this time the surgeon backed him up once again. They were all three bound for Hellier's employ, and the fear of outright kidnapping was a very real one. The captain was perfectly capable of signing them into indentureship under him and selling that to a man on a different island, not Jamaica at all. Again, violence seemed imminent. Perhaps, at this point, even mutiny. Dampier, though, came up with a solution. Those other three, the mason, the carpenter, and the surgeon, were all tradesmen that could work on the ship to secure their passage. However, what the captain saw in Dampier was just a wayward youth. He thought he would be easy to bully, but that just wasn't the case. Dampier knew more about the sea than most men of his age, and he actually, if the captain listened to him, could prove an asset to him. 
You see, back in 1670, Dampier took a job on board the East India men John and Martha on a voyage to the East Indies, to Java. He apprenticed under the ship's navigator and learned the art of navigation by reading the sun and the stars. Now, Dampier took a particular interest in wind currents, and he observed them carefully. And he excelled at navigation. In fact, this voyage was to become the basis for a study that would last his entire life. Years later, Dampier would publish a treatise on wind and water currents that was hugely influential. Elements of that treatise were used by the British Navy until after World War II. For the time being, though, he was just some unknown youth learning the ropes, which was unfortunate. On that voyage to the East Indies, the John and Martha completely passed by their planned stop at St. Helena, and William had his first taste of just what life at sea could be like. They were forced to ration water on board, and nearly ran dry before putting in to collect some more. But in the end, the voyage made it safely back to England. When they did arrive, there was news from the colonies that was fairly big. The admiral of the Jamaica station, some Welshman named Henry Morgan, had attacked and burned Panama to the ground. Now Dampier was fascinated with the West Indies, as were pretty much everybody in Europe. But his fascination was amplified when he heard the tales of what the buccaneers of the Americas had been up to. And rumor had it that Morgan himself was actually in London at that moment, dining and drinking and sharing tales. Quickly, this Morgan was becoming a national hero. For young men like Dampier, it was, well, it was like a lightning rod. You see, the war against Holland was quickly turning serious, and Morgan was something of a propaganda foil, and it was working on men like Dampier and thousands of others that went to sea looking for adventure and maybe a taste of the heroism that Captain Morgan embodied. So Dampier signed up to serve on the HMS Royal Prince. This was a 100-gun, 1,400-ton, first-rate ship of the line. The Royal Prince is like no ship that we've ever discussed in our exploration of piracy, and honestly, it's unlike any ship that we'll most likely look at ever again. The Golden Hind, or, or the Oxford, or the Fortune, or the Fancy, or the Queen Anne's Revenge, they were nothing compared to the Royal Prince. The Royal Prince was the flagship of James, the Lord High Admiral, the Duke of York, and it was brand new. It was only two years old. It was commissioned specifically for this Third Anglo-Dutch War, and it was a force to be reckoned with. It wasn't the sort of ship that any green boy could just sign up to serve on. Now, Dampier was named an able seaman on the ship, and he was among some pretty distinguished company. Legend has it that he was in the company of a man whose name we'll be talking about quite a bit in the future. William Kidd was on that very same ship, during the very same battles as William Dampier, and would likely have been the same rank. They were both young men, so they would have eaten and slept and worked alongside each other. Of course, this was a large ship with a lot of people on it, so they might not have even known each other's names, and neither of them knew that both of them would someday become pretty famous, but maybe, just maybe, over some hard tack, some salt beef, and a tot of rum, these two young men talked about the exploits of Admiral Morgan, who was a force of nature in English society. He hung over everything that these men wanted to be. Maybe they talked about the life of the buccaneers under him, the sailing and drinking and doing whatever they wanted. Maybe Dampier shared tales with Kidd of the island of Madagascar. Maybe he talked about the beautiful girls he'd seen there and the lush land and just what a paradise it was. In the end, Dampier spent two years in naval service. He saw one major naval engagement and spent the last major naval engagement of the war in the hospital. After the war, though, he was sort of aimless. He needed to figure out how to make his fortune. So Colonel Helyar offered him that job that saw him on board the Content and bound for Jamaica. Now, the captain of that vessel wasn't particularly interested in all the expertise that this young man said he carried, and it came close to blows. The other passengers began to arm themselves and take up sides, and the word kidnapping began to be thrown around liberally and loudly. The captain and his men, wanting to avoid potentially losing their ship or their lives, 
backed down and gave the offended parties, that is, Dampier and the other seamen, a joint of beef and a little bit of rum to ease the tension. So William found himself in Port Royal a free man. He was from a tiny village called East Coker, and he found himself in the most sinful place on earth. Now, Dampier had seen the flesh pots of the east and the seedy side of many a city, but nothing in the known world could have prepared him for Port Royal. Now, what might have struck him first was the smell of the place. Port Royal was growing fast, and the city planners weren't overly concerned with sanitation. But this was the old world, so they quickly acclimated to that. But then there was the wealth. It would be hard to fathom for a man who had been all over the world just how rich everyone in Port Royal looked. And these were not noblemen, these were haggard old seamen with scarred, wind-blown faces, but they strode around with swords on their hips and wore fine, polished boots and lordly coats. Now, if you looked closely, those coats were often patched and stained, but they were fine nonetheless. But then there were the women. The women were a revelation. Their skirts were all pinned up to show brightly colored petticoats. The bodice of their dresses was cut low to show as much breast as possible, often stepping well over the line of propriety, and one and all wore corsets or bustiers to enhance that sight. Their chest, neck, and face would have been covered in a fine sheen of white lead paint with just a hint of arsenic. Their cheeks were rouged, their hair fell in tousled curls, and everywhere there were lace and bows and ribbons. Covering up that stench of Port Royal and blending in with it to create a sort of sickly sweet aroma was an ever-present hint of perfume from the many women walking the streets. And men and women all wore fine jewelry as well. They wore gold and silver and earrings. They wore gemstones in men's ears and women's rubies and diamonds on their fingers, and on every woman's neck there was a string of pearls. Now this was not as fine as what you would find in the streets of London or Paris, but it was a sort of filthy approximation of high fashion. And these women, they weren't ladies. They weren't married. These were prostitutes, and they were many and everywhere. And everyone, the prostitutes, the men walking the streets, well, they were all drunk. They lounged on the nearby beach, nursing bottles of sweet Spanish reds. There were brandy merchants walking the streets, and even men drinking mugs of ale. But omnipresent, more than any other drink, was the kill devil. Rum was Jamaica's primary product, and everybody in Jamaica was partaking, from the highest in society to the very, very lowest. Now, all of this would have been a shock, and probably of great interest to a young man like Dampier, but he didn't have much time to spend in Port Royal. He was expected up in Spanish Town to begin work at that plantation owned by Colonel Helliar, Bybrook. As it turned out, Bybrook was an apt name for the plantation. Dampier recorded in his journal that it was located at the end of a river valley, where three streams met to form the Cobra River. He talked about the heavily forested hills that surrounded the property and the dense fog that would envelop the valley every night, only to be burned off at dawn. He talked about the sugar cane as well, its golden and green hues that would light up during the day. But as beautiful as Dampier found the property, he found less joy in his situation. The property manager had greeted him warmly. His name was William Whaley and he was the godson of Colonel Helliar, the owner of the plantation. But but it soon became clear that William Dampier's position was a contentious question. Dampier expected the position that he thought he'd been promised, a superintendent who stood on an equal footing with William Whaley. Whaley, on the other hand, saw this as a threat. Dampier had been instructed to compile reports, on Bybrook and to send them back to Helliar. Whaley, probably correctly, considered Dampier a spy, and he blocked every attempt for him to do so. He demanded that Dampier sign a contract of one year of indentured servitude. He thought that the best place for the arrogant young man was overseeing a boiling house. Now, boiling houses were hell on earth. 
For most slaves on sugar plantations, any other job was preferable to the boiling house. Hours of backbreaking labor in the tropical sun, being whipped bloody anything. You see, the boiling house was where sugar was boiled and turned into molasses. There were three stages. There was the first boiling, which creates a sort of simple sugar. There is a second boiling, which creates a light molasses, and a third, which creates a very dark molasses. It was a terrible job. It was done in an unbearably hot, confined space where the air was thick and smoky and damp. Now that might have been bad enough, it sounds terrible, but the danger was the molasses itself, and that terrified the slaves. You see, you have to stir molasses while it boils, and it bubbled and popped, and when it did, the molasses would stick to you, whoever was boiling it, and it would burn away your skin. It was nearly impossible to get it off, and if you stopped to try to get it off, an overseer was likely to whip you back to work. The day in the boiling house would leave you burning and coughing and bleeding and covered in blisters. So Dampier, as you might expect, refused to take that job. He wrote to Helyar, as did the godson Whaley. Nothing much changed, though. It seems like Helyar didn't have much interest in fixing this situation. During this time, though, Dampier had no income or employment. Mostly, he spent his time and the last of his money getting drunk with the doctor. And that was only when the doctor was free. The doctor spent most of his time treating injuries and illnesses, and when not doing that, he was dealing with a young and wild wife. So in the end, William Dampier buckled. He signed on for a year's servitude, not in the boiling house, but transporting raw sugar. However... He only lasted for six weeks. He was fired for insubordination. He wrote Helyar in disgust, and he left the plantation bound for Port Royal. Now, he would have arrived in Port Royal at just about the right time to see something momentous. A ship called the Jamaica Merchant had arrived in Port Royal, carrying distinguished cargo. Sir Henry Morgan was returned to Jamaica. When he returned, the docks were filled with people waiting to cheer his arrival. They knew that Morgan, more than anyone else, made Jamaica a safe and prosperous place, and likely, now that he was back, he'd fill their pockets a bit in the process, too. Now, there were old buccaneers in the crowd, many of which had sailed on Panama with Morgan, and they were, at best, of a mixed reaction to Morgan coming back. And then there were the locals, the people who had prospered the most from Morgan, the prostitutes and merchants, and even the farmers. But at this point in Jamaica's history, the largest crowd were people just like Dampier. People that were new to Jamaica, lately out of England or Scotland or France. Some of them had come from Tortuga or Barbados or any of a dozen other colonies around the area. Now these people didn't know Morgan, like the locals. They, they'd never sailed with him. They'd never personally seen his bounty flow into Port Royal. But they did know his legend. They'd heard tales of his victories and his grand adventures. They knew him as a bigger-than-life character, sailing the high seas in search of vile Spaniards to fight and defeat. See, Morgan was at this point a legitimate celebrity. His fame had exploded while he'd been in England, and that propaganda campaign out of Whitehall turned him into a real English folk hero. He was a real-life Robin Hood for the seafaring age. So the crowd there in Port Royal drank and cheered and drank some more. The whole town was exuberant at Morgan's return. The grandees up in Spanish Town were a little bit less excited. Many of them were even pretty furious about his return, but that didn't concern a young man like William Dampier. He just wanted a taste of a life like Morgan's. As did many other young men. After seeing Morgan return, men all over the island searched out ships on which they could join, and Dampier did just that. In short order, he was on board a small catch under a captain named Hudsell, headed for Terminios Lagoon, surrounded by real, rough-cut loggers and buccaneers. Now, this voyage's main purpose was trade. They were there to trade with the woodcutters. They loaded up on guns, powder, and shot... They filled their ship up with rum, sugar, spices, a little food, and 
Honestly, probably a slave girl or two. Basically, whatever the buccaneers would need to fill their idle hours. You see, the cutters would carry their own logwood back to Port Royal when their holds were full, but they burned through their initial supplies of rum, spices, tobacco, and other niceties pretty quickly, so many an industrious merchant would sail for their camps to trade with them for what they needed. These merchants were likely former buccaneers themselves, but with more of a mind for trade than manual labor. The buccaneers didn't pay in coin, but in logwood. But there were certain proprieties to observe. Upon arrival in camp, it was expected of the captain to provide a refreshing rum punch blended with fruit juice and spices. Failure to do so could lead to the captain getting the worst quality wood available, often hollowed out and filled with dirt. You see, the cutters would bore out the most valuable part of the wood, fill it with dirt, and then cut a small plug that they'd hammer in place on the end, and then they'd saw off a little bit so it was hard to tell the difference. Luckily, though, Captain Hudsell didn't fail to provide the punch, and the cutters and the crew of his ship had quite a party. There was all the drinking and feasting and partying all night that you might expect. Dampier, though, was taken with their lifestyle. He recorded all the details he could from his short stay, everything from their clothes to their sleeping arrangements to their cooking implements. It was actually here that he became the first Englishman to record the word barbecue from the Indian barbacoa. He used it to describe their sleeping platforms, which were a uh, frame raised up from the ground that they uh, spread sackcloth or sailcloth over to provide a sort of mosquito net. He also used the word barbecue to describe their method of cooking. It was basically the same thing, only instead of sailcloth, they would use uh, dried mud to make an oven. Now, Dampier was far from the first to use the word barbecue. It was, after all, an old Indian word that was adopted by the Spanish and then the French and then passed on to the English and Dutch. He didn't invent the word, and he didn't invent the barbecue itself. It had been in use for centuries, and it was, after all, the root of the word buccaneer itself. Dampier wasn't even the first person to publish the word barbecue. Even though he was writing before Exquamelon would write the Buccaneers of America, Exquamelon actually published long before Dampier ever did. He was, however, the first English writer to publish the word, which is why he is cited in the Oxford English Dictionary as the root of the word barbecue in the English language, along with more than a thousand other entries. In their book, A Pirate of Exquisite Mind, Diana and Michael Preston wrote, quote, Dampier can claim more than 1,000 entries in the Oxford English Dictionary. To take only the first three letters of the alphabet, he gave to the English language such words as avocado, barbecue, breadfruit, cashew, and chopsticks. End quote. They go on to talk about how he first described Chinese soy sauce and Thai fish sauce. Yeah, there's a lot of food stuff in there, but to be fair, we almost always adopt foreign words when describing their own food. You know, we don't call tortillas something like corn pancakes. But eventually the voyage left the Bay of Campeche in late 1675 and headed back to Port Royal. The journey hit a snag before they reached home, though. On their way out of the bay, they saw a pair of unfamiliar sails on the horizon, now, Captain Hudsell asserted that they must be other traders or cutters bound for the logwood camps, but his men disagreed. They argued and kind of hit an impasse on exactly what to do. Luckily, though, they'd picked up an old-time buccaneer at the camp who knew better than any of them. He recognized the sails as Spanish Garda Costa and convinced the captain to alter his course as a mere precaution. When he did alter his course, the two ships adjusted theirs as well to follow the catch. It was now clear that they were being pursued, almost certainly by the Spanish. Now their ship was a slow, lumbering merchant vessel, and the Coast Guard were built for interception. All the same, though, the catch ran. Now the chase took several hours. Chases at sea were pretty slow affairs, but eventually the Spanish vessels were closing in on them close enough for the men on board each ship to see the men on the other deck. Then, when they were just out of firing range, the wind died. All three ships faltered and sat idle in the calm. While they were waiting, the men on board the Spanish vessels readied their guns and their weapons and prepared to attack and board. But on the catch, 
they adjusted their sails to catch where they expected the wind to come up, and luck struck. What Dampier describes as a sudden tornado blew in, and the resulting gale gave the English ship the push it needed to just get going. Now, of course, that pushed the Spanish ships as well, but the Spanish hadn't adjusted their sails, and they were blown the wrong direction. So, as the English sailed away, the Spanish fired off a single salvo and gave up the chase. Now, after that, you might expect it to be smooth sailing, but the catch had been forced off course by the chase, and they had trouble finding their way again. For days, they just drifted around aimlessly, trying to find the wind, but they never really caught a decent breeze. Now, Dampier spent his days recording the various birds that found their way onto the ship, but soon he and a number of the other men began to grow frustrated with the captain. Now, if you believe Dampier, he said he could have found the proper wind currents, but to Captain Hudsell, once again, he was just a green boy who didn't know these seas. But after several days of floating, they finally drifted to an island off the coast of Cuba. Now, that isn't exactly where any English ships wants to be found, but much less one carrying contraband from the Spanish main. It was, though, better than the open sea, so the entire crew went ashore and decided to hunt for food. It turned out to be a fairly disappointing affair. Dampier had his fingers pinched while he was digging for crabs in the sand. The captain wounded a hog but failed to kill it before it got away. Then, to make matters worse, they found footprints on what they believed to be an uninhabited island. Then, two men failed to make the rendezvous at dusk. It seemed that they'd been captured by whomever made the footprint, either hostile natives or perhaps a Spanish squadron. In the morning, they heard two gunshots, which alerted them to approaching men. They armed and prepared to defend themselves, but they sent out some scouts who found their two wayward shipmates alive and unharmed. Now, they had some better luck hunting that day, and they also stocked up on water before heading back out to sea. Now, their supplies kept them alive, but they didn't exactly satisfy, and they didn't last long. Soon, they were on light rations and hoping to make it home before they ran out of food. They thought themselves within the Windward Passage, when it became clear that a decision had to be made. There was virtually no food left, and there were two options on header. They could sail south for Jamaica, which was lush and friendly, but far away. Or they could head for the south keys of Cuba, where food was uncertain and the danger of capture was high, but those keys were much closer. Now the captain argued for the keys, and Dampier argued for Jamaica. Dampier said that it wasn't as far as the captain believed it was, and it was a much safer option besides. It would take a few more days of empty bellies, but it would be certain to end in safety and a full stomach. The keys, he argued, on the other hand, might end with no food to find and more days lost. At that point, the men would be hungry and too weak to hunt or sail. Perhaps, in the worst-case scenario, they would actually wind up in a Spanish prison or hanging from the end of a Spanish rope. The argument to sail for Jamaica was a reasonable, clear-headed, and well-thought-out argument made from a place of logic. The men voted for the keys. Dampier was frustrated with the men, and especially with the foolish captain. This was not the first, and it would not be the last time in his life. He knew that he personally could do better. But then, to their astonishment, they saw in the distance land. It was the north coast of Jamaica. They were closer than anyone but William Dampier had believed, and they were safe. That night, before reaching the island, they met a merchantman out of New England, whose captain came aboard and shared some food with them, some water, and copious amounts of rum punch. The next morning, stronger, due to their full bellies, but likely a bit sluggish from all the punch, the catch made her way to Port Royal. Now back in town, Dampier had a decision to make. He was dissatisfied with his wages from that merchant voyage, considering all of the hardship he'd endured, but he knew that he had to find some way to make his fortune. So he decided that instead of joining another merchant expedition, he would actually join a logging expedition to Terminos Lagoon. He spent all of the wages he had earned on gun, along with some powder and some shot, and the tools needed to cut logwood, and then the rest he spent on food and shelter. He also brought along with him quill, paper, and ink, and plenty of it. 
So he headed for the bay and he set up camp along with some of his shipmates. Now at the time there were somewhere around 250 logwood cutters in the bay, all of them working hard to avoid the eyes of the Spanish. At the time there were a number of notorious names there. The bay was filled with men who will concern our story later on, many crewmen, quartermasters, gunners on ships that will drive fear into the hearts of men, but none of those are more famous than the young, virtually unknown logwood cutter known as Henry Avery. Dampier enjoyed his time in the Bay of Campeche. He was always deeply concerned with his own personal freedom, which for the past several years had been in some level at jeopardy, and he found the life of the logwood cutters a wonderful one. He enjoyed all the trappings, the drinking, the sex, the sense of being removed from the trappings of civilization. More than anything, it was that. He loved being out in the wilderness. When he wasn't working in the camp, he took long walks through the jungles and savannas surrounding the camp, and he documented every creature that he was unfamiliar with, in such detail that many ornithologists still reference his work today. He was the first to document tarantulas, fire ants, uh, sloths, uh, and a host of other flora and fauna. He actually, at one point, tripped over a crocodile and fell three times before getting away. He had a run-in with some monkeys, in which they pelted him with rocks and feces until he ran away. Then they followed him and continued to pelt him until they made sure he was gone. He got stung, he was bitten, and once he even had two tiny white worms burrow their way into his calf until he squeezed them out. For Dampier, this was heaven. It was here that his works on the natural world began. These works would go on to be the primary inspiration for men like Charles Darwin, and even some modern scientists hold this study in a high regard. Now, he gave a description of the logwood cutter's life, but most of it's fairly by the book. They cut and hauled and refined and loaded the wood. Tampier tells us of how they hid their ships from prying Spanish eyes. They did so behind the banks of trees and how they hid when a Spanish ship sailed up on he and his companions while out fishing. What they did was they actually climbed over the side of the canoe and then submerged the boat just under the water. They were light enough and and made from a buoyant enough material that they didn't sink, they just sat there, barely covered by the water. The men would float with barely the top of their heads above water, just enough to breathe, and then they would stay there while the Spanish sails passed them by, none the wiser. It took several months of logwood cutting, but finally they were about ready to leave when disaster struck. A hurricane swept across the lagoon, scattering the cutters to any shelter they could find. Most of them huddled in hastily built shelters. They were just basically frames of logwood that were surrounded by palm leaves. They pounded wooden stakes on the huts to hold them in place, and sometimes they would actually lay lengths of rope on the top to hold down the roof, Sometimes they would strap everything down with rope, but still, nearly all of the huts were blown away or demolished in the storm. Now, the skilled craftsman, the one who made the best huts, might have stayed in shelter throughout the storm, but even the best still failed to keep the rain out. So, for even those who were luckiest, it was days of no sleep, no eating, and terror. But finally, the hurricane passed and the men emerged. Things turned out to be worse than they'd expected. The hurricane actually hit the bay worse than it had hit the camps. Most of the ships had pulled free of their mooring, and those that were still afloat were nowhere to be seen. One ship actually blew ashore surrounded by a mountain of dead and dying fish. Now, they did actually find one vessel afloat with most of her cargo, and they were actually able to use that shorebound ship to help repair her. Still, though, nearly all the logwood collected in that season on Terminios Lagoon and all of the possessions that the men had brought with them were lost in the storm. To Dampier, and honestly to most of the other men, all must have seemed lost. His wages from the stint on the plantation and his profits from the previous trading voyage to the bay were all gone, sunk into his investment for this logwood expedition, and now everything was gone. He would have to slink back to Jamaica, penniless, perhaps even, God forbid, indenture himself for a year of hard and thankless labor. But his companions had a better idea. 
You see, they were old hands at this sort of thing, and they'd seen a thing or two. Most of them had been sailing these waters for years, and some of them, well, they knew how to earn a living when all seemed lost. You see, there were a lot of men cutting logwood, and only one ship to get them back to Jamaica. So the only logical solution here was to go out there and find a few more ships. Fishing ships, merchant vessels, mayhap even a galley. They might just surprise a Coast Guard ship and commandeer her in the night. It just makes sense to take that last ship and bring back more to carry our boys back home. We couldn't just leave them stranded out here in foreign territory, could we? That wouldn't be the Christian thing to do. And what's more, we've lost all our logwood, all our supplies, all our money. We're destitute. Maybe these ships that are just here to carry us back to Jamaica, well, maybe they'll have something of value on them. Sugar or cotton or maybe tobacco, maybe dyes, maybe wine, maybe chests of silver or pearls. You know, actually, this might work out. We might come out on top. So they put the question to William Dampier. His time in the Navy made him actually an asset to these men, and they wanted him on board. He knew navigation better than most, and he had the experience in a naval war that many of these men didn't. So why not come with us, they asked. You'd be good in a fight. We could use you. Dampier agreed. Now, the ragtag group called themselves privateers, and some of them might even have had an old battered letter of Mark hidden away somewhere. If they did, it wasn't valid at this point, but a flimsy shield is better than none. No, these men were outright pirates. Now Dampier, in his writing, was clear to distance himself from them. He was, quote, with them but not among them, end quote. Of course, that was what he wrote into a book he published years later in England that he expected to be read by London society and his academic peers. This in an era when piracy was causing very real problems. Men like Henry Avery and Captain Kidd were busy terrorizing the world. Not exactly the best time to publish a book confessing to a life of piracy. As such, he was light on the details. So to take his account at face value, it seems like it was just a bunch of men on vacation, sailing and hunting game and going on hikes. And he wrote down all the cool birds he saw and the plants and the animals, he just neglected to mention all of the ships they took, all of the cities they ransacked, and all of the Spanish victims they left in their wake. The only real exploit that he made note of was their raid on Alvarado in the state of Veracruz. The buccaneers attacked a castle there with about 60 men and fought a protracted assault. They lost 10 or 11 of their men, but they took the castle. Unfortunately, none of them had learned the lessons that Morgan had learned the hard way. In that protracted assault, the locals had had time to escape with all of their valuables downriver. They did, however, find in the town several hundred parrots, which were actually pretty valuable. Now, they're, of course, beautiful, colorful birds. They can be taught to talk, which is pretty cool. And that picture of a pirate with a parrot on his shoulders is kind of cliche, but actually pretty accurate. They were kind of a symbol of all of the exotic mystique that the New World had to offer. Among pirates, it was a status symbol, that you were doing well, and it showed men who might be looking for a crew that you were a captain worth signing up with. Now, parrots sold back in the London bird markets for extravagant amounts, and if you found yourself stranded out at sea with no wind in your sails, and several hundred parrots on your vessel, well, they started to look like quite a feast. So the crew packed their ship to bursting with parrot cages. He said that it was actually hard to walk between them, and it made some of the work on board pretty difficult. And I can only imagine the mess they made, and, oh, the sound? You could have heard that ship coming from miles off. Then, perhaps someone did, because seven ships out of Veracruz sailed into sight. Now, it was clear that they had come there to deal with these pirates. You see, for more than a year, this crew had harassed shipping in the region, and now that they'd attacked this town near Veracruz, the Spanish knew just where to find them. This crew of pirates made good their escape, though. Their only real casualty was some of the cargo. They had some logwood aboard, which after the debacle at Laguna Terminos, would have fetched a good price, but they were forced to dump it overboard. 
It appeared that, for the pirates, this was a good time to call an end to the voyage. It makes sense. A ship with hundreds of parrot cages on it couldn't be a pleasant place. Plus, they'd have to feed the birds, which really couldn't last for long. So it was a good time to head back to Port Royal and sell off their cargo. It netted William Dampier a good profit. After his four years in the New World, he had earned enough money to sail back for England. Next time on Gentlemen and Scoundrels Part 2, we're going to continue our look at William Dampier, but we're also going to expand a look at some other pirates in the region, including John Coxon, Bartholomew Sharp, and the return of Admiral Sir Henry Morgan. I hope everybody enjoyed today's episode. I'd like to thank everybody for listening, and I'd like to thank everybody for supporting the show. Everybody who has left a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, everybody who has told their friends about the show or shared us online, everybody who has signed up to support us on Patreon, we couldn't do this without all of your help, and I appreciate every last one of you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out by now, you really should. You can always do so over at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can check us out on Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud, or YouTube. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening. <laughs>